Okay, so today we are talking about album art and design as visual communication. And I think what's really interesting in a digital design oriented class is that there are so many ways and contexts in which we can apply digital design in really interesting ways to objects, ideas, music that has function beyond the art itself. So that's sort of where we're getting started. And today I'm going to show you a lot of different examples of album artwork that really pushes boundaries as far as the uh, conceptual design of it, as well as how it was received or presented or produced. So without further ado, let's get started talking about interactive designs, album art that has been released that has an interactive component to it. To it. Uh, one example that I really love is the 2007 album Casa Daga by Bright Eyes. So when this CD was released, um, the album actually came with a decoder that you could position over all of this like strange staticky looking gray space and the decoder actually trans transferred it into uh, visible forms. So for example, here's um, a little video that I found on Depop that we can watch that sort of demonstrates what this uh, looks like. So you can kind of see as that decoder is placed on top of the album, palm trees and pyramids and this really interesting psychedelic reality starts to come forward uh, in using this holographic decoder. And of course, this person talking about the experience is very excited about it. And it sort of just adds this other layer of intimacy and interactivity into an album and into the design where the design is actually layered uh, in a way that it has to be uncovered by the viewer. Uh, this Black Moses album by Isaac Hayes is a 2016 album that came out, and if you unpackage the vinyl record, you can see Joel Brodsky's full image, um, very much in the Christ-like form of um, the artist Isaac Hayes. And Joel Brodsky is an American photographer who was really well known for specifically his photography of mu musicians, particularly his young lion photographs of Jim Morrison. And he, over the course of his whole lifetime, photographed over 400 album covers, which is pretty amazing. So, you know, thinking about this artist coming out with this amazing, you know, this amazing album, Black Moses, sort of incorporates that Christ-like feel to both the shape of the album when it's uh, unpackaged as well as the costume that the artist is wearing on the cover. Another example that I love <laughs> that is um, a very interactive experience is the Teenage Dream album by Katy Perry, which came out in 2010. The interesting thing about this album, if you never bought a copy yourself, is that when you unpackaged it, it actually smells like cotton candy. And an interesting story is that the original edition actually had to be taken off the shelves because people were complaining that it did not smell good. It did not smell like good cotton candy. And so the whole thing was redone and repackaged with a new cotton candy smell after the fact based on uh, consumers' complaints. So another category of album uh, design that I think is important to talk about is the area of social critique. So if we look at this album artwork by um, Maddie Klarwine, which was for the Live Evil uh, album by Miles Davis, a jazz music musician, this album came out in 1971 there are uh, two sides to it. So the, the live side is the pregnant woman um, on the right with beautiful graphical iconography on one side. And then on the other side is this sort of sluggish Jaja -Ja the Hutt uh, looking character uh, on the left. And the album cover was actually illustrated by the artist Maddie Clarwine, who had painted the front cover independently of Davis before Miles Davis said, oh yeah, this should definitely be 
the front of the album. Um, but for the back, Davis said, um, you know, I was doing a picture of the pregnant woman for the cover and the day I finished, um, Clara Wine says, Miles called me up and said, I want a picture of life on one side and evil on the other. And all he mentioned was this image of a toad. And next to me was a copy of Time Magazine, which had Edgar Hoover on the cover, and he just looked exactly like a toad. I told Miles, I found the toad. And so that's a quote from Clara Wine himself. Plastic Surgery Disasters by the Dead Kennedys, um, very much post-punk album uh, from 1982, uh, appropriated and utilized album art by photographer Michael Wells. Uh, and this particular photographic piece is called Hand. And this is actually not the only album cover that the photograph has been used on. But there's a really interesting contrast between the stark imagery of the, the white male human hand, um, or I guess I, I assume that that's what it is, um, holding on to this shriveled uh, hand from uh, a child in Uganda. Uh, and the example is emotive imagery from, uh, a, it's a, a photograph of a child in Uganda holding hands with a missionary. This album, uh, Go To by XTC, Ecstasy, in 1980, 1978, uh, is album art by the artist Hypnosis. What's really interesting about this album cover is that it directly relates back to the idea of what you see on the shelf is the thing that you purchase. So the sort of consumerism impact of the album cover as being this eye-catchy thing. So Ecstasy was working with Hypnosis to determine what could they put into text form that sort of has a lean or a bent towards it being, um, you know, this is this is a product. So if you read it, it says this is a record com cover. This writing is the design upon the record cover. D the design is to help sell the record. We hope to draw your attention to it and encourage you to pick it up. When you've done that, maybe you'll be persuaded to listen to the music. In this case, the go-to album. Then we want you to buy it. The idea being that the more of the more that you buy this record, the more money Virgin Records, the manager Ian Reed, and XTC that themselves will make. To the aforementioned, this is known as pleasure. So you'll notice <laughs> that they um, intentionally capitalize victim and stop reading and trick, tricks, trick, product, product, foolish, record cover as uh, this subliminal messaging to get the person to really double take and really consider the product aspect of the art, uh, the art delivered as a product. Mezzanine by Massive Attack uh, came out in 1998. And this album cover was photographed by uh, Nick Knight and was produced with the designer Tom Hingston. And um, if you look at the notes in the slides, uh, you can read the full interview with uh, Tom Hingston and about how this particular album cover came together. But uh, Massive Attack, if you haven't heard them, they're a trip hop band with a sort of wonderful sounding uh, female singer at the front. And if you think about what was going on in 1998, there were a lot of albums being released by like Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, Britney Spears, Bewitched. Uh, you know, a lot of these artists who had a very pop situation. We're creating pop music to be consumed by a pop music audience. And so what Massive Attack, the artist, the band, what they wanted to do was put something up on those shelves right next to those glittery, bubbly pop albums that had a sort of sinister, strange, and unexpected image to it. And thus came Nick Knight's photograph that ended up on the cover of Massive Attack, which really can alter how we think about branding as um, a strategy. Does it make sense to brand something with an image that creates a sense of shock or disgust as much as it does, you know, putting the on the cover, um, you know, the, the beautiful image of a pop artist uh, that's that's been photoshopped and sort of done up uh, with makeup, etc. So very, very interesting contrast created here. 
In Through the Outdoor by Led Zeppelin was an album that came out in 1979, and the album art was created by Storm Thurgerson of, uh, again, this artist collective, Hypnosis. So if you notice, there are six different album covers uh, presented here, and um, each one presents a slightly different photograph, but each of them are photographs of the exact same scene. This man in a white hat sitting in a bar, and it's shown from a number of different perspectives. So what happened when Led Zeppelin released the album is if you went to go purchase your vinyl record, you actually didn't know which of the records you were going to end up with. So they were all covered in brown, uh, brown, like a brown paper bag wrapping, and then you would take that album out and find an amazing photographic image. And what was cool, if you were um, a huge Led Zeppelin fan, was that you could absolutely trade and discuss and show off your record, your record that you'd gotten because it might be different than your three friends who had purchased the same album. But what I think is really interesting and what I find interesting about all of the photographs in this series of album covers is that each one shows a different perspective and it almost becomes like a film noir murder mystery scene where the detective is maybe paused for the day to look through his files but something's happened in this bar the further we get away we notice the spilled bottle on the floor the overturned chair there's just so much wonderful detail to unpack in this series um not to mention the woman standing next to the jukebox seductively looking over his shoulder in the background this album cover uh that What Is Not by Public Image Limited in 1992 is when this one came out. Um, the album art is by The Art of Public Image Limited. You can click on that link to learn more about them. Uh, but as you can see, even though this, this image that is behind the band's logo is um, sort of abstracted, it's a drawing, it is super subversive it's designed to make you feel like you're looking at um a body part and reconsidering that and also thinking well it is but it also might not be or maybe this is the subliminal message that this sort of post-punk band wants to bring your mind into kind of bring into that space and what's really interesting about public image limited is that they experimented with this uh, extensively in many of their album covers. Uh, so that brings me to my next example, same band, different album, 1986, again from the Art of Public Image Limited. And what's interesting about this album cover is that they were super straightforward in presenting it as album by Public Image Limited. That is all that it says. The album itself is titled album. And, uh, there's a sort of, you know, middle finger attitude here going on where it's like, yeah, the record label wants us to put out an album. We put out an album. The art is what's contained within it. And we are decidedly turning against the branding standards and expectations that perhaps the record label industry uh, and the music industry has for us. So it's a very basic bare album cover. They used Helvetica uh, Helvetica bold font. Um, so it's easy to read, but just a very subversive way of presenting their music. This album cover, uh, called strange, uh, by St. Vincent is uh, strange mercy, which was released in 2011. The album art was designed by St. Vincent, the artist herself and photographed by Tina Tyrell. And um, this particular album came out of a time where St. Vincent was cloistered out in the middle of nowhere in um, a cabin working on writing music and was dealing with a lot of sensations of isolation and aloneness and also the, the freedom of sort of delving into one's own mind and creating the art that can come out of that. And so this album cover I think is really effective and uncanny and strange because it's her mouth uh, sucking through uh, a white plastic material which is super interesting and a little bit scary a little bit horrifying 
Um, but Strange Mercy was written in Seattle when she was spending that time in isolation, and she described it as a, quote, lonely, loneliness experiment and a, quote, cleanse um, and an escape from the modern information overload that she was experiencing in New York. So um, really interesting. And you can actually read a uh, quote from an interview by Annie Clark from St. Vincent if you check out the notes in this PowerPoint or Google Slides. Next, for something completely different, um, Pen and Pixel are album artists who have worked with many up-and-coming hip-hop artists from Atlanta and Florida and the Southern rap and hip-hop scene in general. So they designed this album cover for T-Mac, Shinin, and Big Nibin, 1999. Uh, and what's great about their work is that it incorporates so many different layers of collage, and specifically collage that deals with material wealth, uh, fantasy, imagination, and uh, sort of building this sort of life of luxury around these artists. For example, he has a panther on the on the leash. There's a big orange Jeep in the background, a huge mansion, and all of these things sort of collide and come together in strange and unexpected ways. This album cover um, by Pen and Pixel for uh, the artist 2 Def Straight Doing That Fool, 1997. Again, we have all of these different layers coming together. These crazy shifts in scale and presentation of, um, you know, how, how large is a person compared to, to what? How small is this house compared to, you know, the, the man about to pour champagne all over this um, sort of smaller than life bed. And um, Pen and Pixel, I think, you know, speaking of sort of absurdism and ridiculousness, but also like what is the furthest possible place we can take digital art to create this brand image for a hip hop artist based on what they're singing about, based on the idea of control and desire and luxury, what does that look like? And I think Pen and Pixel captures that um, that culture really well. Um, as a quote um, about Pen and Pixel, with the internet as hip hop's most influential medium and the rise of blogging and social media, spearheading growing interest in photography and graphic design, an artist album cover today looks vastly different back in the day when Pen and Pixel were desi designing nearly every Southern rap album in sight. And Pen and Pixel themselves are a Houston-based company that rose to fame in the world of Southern rap in the 90s after designing an endless number of covers for No Limit, Cash Money, and other artists. Uh, next, uh, Von Oliver is absolutely an interesting artist to talk about. If we look at the, um, the Breeders album, P.O.D. from 1991, uh, Oliver is really well known for pushing the boundaries of typography in his work. So you can kind of see how he's experimented with um, the three layers going on here between the the, which actually becomes quite dominant on uh, the surface of this, and then breeders, which has sort of a smushed italic look to it, but is still legible, and then pod, and then all of this text is overlaid on this sort of washy, ambiguous form that has an alien-like figure in this this um, almost like a, a vortex of movement and motion. And if you think about if you think about some of the tracks on this album in particular, one of the track names is Happiness is a Warm Gun. Certainly uh, an evocative and aggressive and political album. Uh, you know, speaking of sort of the social implications of um, what it means what it means to have a gun, what what comfort that that can bring, but also the sort of fear and destruction. And so um, I think Von Oliver captures a lot of the spirit really well in this album cover in particular. Von Oliver's cover for Lush in 1994, their album Split, 
Um, again, we can see a lot of play between the typography, which has a wonderful hand-drawn effect for the band's name, and it's overlaid on this uh, beautiful film fo photograph of lemons sitting on the surface, and then uh, we have text overlaid on the right-hand side as well. Another example from Von Oliver, and again, I've linked his name up top, so if you want to check out more of his work, I definitely encourage you to dig uh, deeper into the slide presentation and check it out. But he's created a number of different designs for the band The Pixies, um, another sort of rock, post-punk um, group, and has incorporated both typography in interesting ways. You can see the, the name of The Pixies, uh, put through this spirally strange world with almost an alien or automaton head and then text that's laid in um, you know even the numbers being cropped off at the bottom of the example I've showed you on the right and we get this immersive space that becomes so much more about the image than about the text which I think is one of the most successful aspects of his work. Another common strategy in album art and design is the idea of appropriation. And we see appropriation in art a lot. When one artist takes something from another artist and um, sort of appropriates it and makes it their own. It happens all the time, um, you know, and uh, depending on what it is, you can get away with quite a bit before dealing with anything as far as like legal battles or legal struggles for that appropriation, depending on whether or not what you're doing is covered under the fair use clause. But I think that this uh, album cover, uh, Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness by the Smashing Pumpkins from 1995, is a really interesting example. And um, I've included a link to a wonderful interview where you can hear a little bit more about this album cover. But the album art is by John Craig. And at first glance, it sort of looks like a, a classical painting of some kind, uh, combined with uh, a supernatural world in, in some kind of strange universe. But if you break it down, the woman on the cover is actually the combination between two different paintings. Um, he sort of appropriated Jean-Baptiste Gruez's The Souvenir, Fidelity, where um, the, the primary subject is clutching her dog in fear of the storm gathering behind her. Uh, maybe imagining that she's portrayed in the throes of longing for an absent lover. Uh, but it's combined with another painting, uh, Raphael St. Catherine of Alexandria. His depiction adopts Catherine's traditional attribute, the wheel that broke during her martyrdom. But instead of stressing the horrific aspect of the event, Raphael has her leaning on the broken wheel in a relaxed, classical pose. So you can see how these images come together to form uh, the final album art in a really strange way. Just the whole expression and pose of this woman is so striking and so, so strange. Paul's Boutique by the Beastie Boys is an interesting one uh, and an interesting example of appropriation. The album came out in 1989 and uh, it is based on a photograph by Jeremy Sh Shatton. And the album art is credited to Nathaniel Hornblower, who essentially took one small piece of this photograph that shows the image of Paul's boutique from an entire panoramic landscape, which is the original photo. And just that very small slice, you can see it here on the far left, is what ultimately became the album cover. Power, Corruption, and Lies by New Order, 1983. The album art is by Peter Seville, but uh, you might notice that it looks quite a bit like a, uh, again, a classical or romantic um, painting. And it's actually a reproduction of the painting A Basket of Roses by the French artist Henri Fantin Latour, uh, which is a part of the National Gallery's permanent collection in London. And he'd originally planned to use a portrait for the album cover, but... Um, <laughs> Instead, when he was at the gallery, um, Seville picked up a postcard with this Latour painting and his girlfriend mockingly asked him if he was going to use it for the cover. And Seville then realized it was a great idea. And Seville suggested that the flowers um, 
quote, suggested the means by which power, corruption, and lies infiltrate our lives. They're seductive, um, which becomes a really interesting interpretation of the album cover uh, and the music by New Order on Power, Corruption, and Lies. And this album cover has become so iconic that the album cover has been appropriated a second and a third time. For example, when uh, the brand Supreme and Vans collaborated to create these shoes with the uh, New Order album cover on the shoes to make um, a further statement of appropriation. And lastly, um, in this category, I think this is a, a fantastic example of just an album cover that takes a few strange components and pieces them together. In David Byrne's album Feelings from 1997, Stefan Sagmister has taken the sort of four by three imaging of the TV screen that was dominant at the time and combined it with this really strange Barbie slash mannequin head of um <laughs> of david byrne and so uh it, it just becomes this quite uncanny moment of realizing you know who is the artist how much has the artist been produced or modified or changed and this is you know 1997 so sort of on the brink of a lot of digital uh, modification and digital processing for music Another category of album art and design that I think is really important to talk about is uh, the idea of album art that speaks to altered states and otherworldly design. So we're talking about sort of psychedelia and, um, you know, enjoying substances while listening to intense psychedelic type music or not so intense, really, depending on, on what you're into. Uh, this third stage by Boston uh, album art was designed by Paula Shear and illustrated by uh, Roger Huisen. And this album artwork has a massive following behind it, uh, I think almost to the extent that the album itself does, because it incorporates these incredible sci-fi graphics that take pieces and parts of various instruments and cities. For example, you can see uh, the skyline of Boston in the spaceship um, encapsulated above on the image on the right. You can see the pipes of an organ uh, constructed into this uh, small rocket ship that's blasting out, um, out of the atmosphere in the image on the left. And um, there's a wonderful interview with uh, Paula Shear, who talks about the album's design in an interview in The Atlantic, if you want to check out the link that I've included there. Um, and she says, even to this day, she's mystified by the continued interest in the album package um, because she, she says to herself, well, in my opinion, it's honestly just a mediocre piece of work. <laughs> So um, what's wonderful is this guitar ship, um, right, I, I should mention the shape of the, of the ship is a guitar. If you look at sort of the perspective shift that happens, um, you can see the frets going back into space on each of these ships. These have been incorporated into their live shows, projected on huge walls behind them during the performance. It's just a, a really wonderful graphic and uh, illustration. The Dark Side of the Moog by Klaus Schultz and Pete Namlock. I'm, I could not find who designed the album artwork for these, um, but each of the vinyl records link together to form larger pictures that show this wonderful intergalactic spatial landscape. So if you want to check out more of this, definitely click the link that I've included in the presentation. Relayer by Yes, the 1974 album uh, <laughs> was designed by Roger Dean. And speaking of these sort of fantastical, imaginative spaces, uh, I think Yes, as a rock band, as sort of a, a psychote psychedelic band, has absolutely played with all of these different ideas of otherworldly spaces where maybe that album, those soaring guitar lines might take you as you, the listener, are tuning in. So I've included a few examples here of these wonderful illustrations by Roger Dean, which you could find uh, at really wonderful, high resolution, high quality detail if you purchased any of these albums 
on vinyl and you listen to them. And so there's sort of uh, a, a wonderful album experience going on. Roger Dean has also designed album art for uh, Asia. This is their album Alpha from 1983. Again, you can kind of see uh, an illustrative effect, but it all almost feels like um, a collage, the way that all of the different plants and components and animals are all so separate from each other in this really interesting, fascinating dream space. This is a really interesting one. Uh, speaking of alt altered states and otherworldly designs. This album artwork for Revolver by the Beatles is designed by Klaus Wormann. And for the, the cover of Revolve, Revolver, um, this German artist, Wormann, was one of the Beatles' oldest friends from their time in Hamburg in the early 1960s. And um, generally speaking, he, he would use their photographs to create collages and drawings uh, and in this case, part drawing and part collage that came together uh, eventually for um, this album cover. Uh, Vorman placed the various photos within the tangle of hair that connects the four faces, and Turner writes that um, <laughs> the drawings show each beetle, quote, in another state of consciousness, unquote, such that the older images appear to be tumbling out from them, out from their brains. So if you were wondering what I meant by this, yes, I do mean that the Beatles are <laughs> depicted here uh, potentially very high, but these are drawings of them. And you can kind of see their eyes uh, being the realistic eyeballs uh, on top of the drawn faces. Fox Confessor Brings the Flood by Nico Case, 2008. The album art is by Julie Morstadt. Uh, again, speaking of illustrations, altered altered realities, I think this is a really great example. And also of an artist really sort of defining her style by this wonderful, unique, illustrative, almost children's book-esque visual language that uh, played a part in many of her music videos as well. So the illustrations on the album covers ultimately come to life in their own world in uh, her music videos. So definitely check out, um, check this out as well from the slide presentation. Uh, this album artwork by Mark Farrow is for Ladies and Gentlemen, We Are Floating in Space by the band Spiritualized, which is an album that came out in 1997. And what's really interesting about the packaging of this album art is that it is designed to sort of be presented in the format of prescription drugs. And um, <laughs> it's also designed in uh, Mark Farrow's trademark minimalistic style. So it re relies heavily on the Helvetica font and um, also references, as I mentioned, this all too familiar packaging of prescription medicine echoing the themes of both the album as well as the arrow, uh, as well as the er era. And Farrow even went so far as to create a version in an enlarged medicine box with an oversized blister pack containing the disc and a lengthy leaflet with dosage instructions. So if you look very carefully at, um, at the, the text that's included in this album, it's fascinating because you've got all of these different prescription drug requirements and restrictions exactly as it would be if you saw it printed in a magazine. Uh, for example, <laughs> your doctor will advise you when to stop taking spiritualized after a few weeks it's worth trying to get by without it this will help prevent you becoming too used to it and re reduce the risk of dependence um but here we have all the active ingredients as all of the band members we have what constitutes spiritualized tablets we have our set list our song list excuse me and um the leaflet uh, please keep it in a safe place you may want to read it again um, which is just fantastic. And there are multiple versions of this released where the, um, the discs, the CDs themselves uh, become these pills that you can pop out from the packaging uh, when it was released as um, CDs as opposed to vinyl. <clears throat> Otherworldly Space, I feel like I can't talk about this without speaking to Rainbow, the 2017 album by Kesha, which has album artwork designed by um, 
Robert Beatty with art direction by R Brian Rodinger and photography by Olivia B. And what's great about this, and absolutely check out more of Robert Beatty's work. It is just phenomenal and ridiculous and intergalactic and amazing. But this album represented Kesha coming forward as her own artist, finally unchained from the producer who did not allow her to release her own original music and saying, I am here, I am now, I am present. This is a new dawn for me and my world of ridiculous, the way that I see it and that I've always wanted it to be. And so this album cover absolutely references that and um, it's phenomenal. So many different parts coming together. Alex Gray is very well known for many of his paintings and drawings that have become a part of rock band, uh, metal band, really, Tools aesthetic. And this is their album cover, Lateralis, from 2001. And you can imagine at their live shows, seeing Alex Gray's beautiful illustration and multiple layers of um, sort of a combination between illustration and scientific and anatomical drawings coming together in these super psychedelic images. Um, and then my last category is that of musicians that draw. So uh, musicians who have drawn their own album artwork or created and designed their own album album artwork. Jillian Welch, wonderful example, um, who drew her own album artwork for The Harrow and The Harvest from 1998. And not only that, but used a large printmaking, uh, a large printmaker to actually produce and reproduce uh, in a very handmade way each of her individual album covers. So if you want to learn more about that, definitely check out a bit of the behind the scenes of the process from this feature by NPR that I've included in the slides. Grimes also has drawn much of her own artwork as well. And especially since 2015, um, Claire Boucher has grown both in popularity as well as name recognition, especially because of her relationship and now child with uh, entrepreneur Elon Musk. And um, it's, I think, over often overlooked and important to mention that, especially for her early albums, uh, she drew all of the images and graphics, both uh, on the cover as well as in the sleeve of these albums where she could fully express the characters that she was performing when singing the songs on the album. And uh, for Art Angels, she actually drew a different character for each of the tracks on the album. So uh, sort of drawing to a close here, if you're wondering, well, what's the point of albums in the post-album era? We live in a time of Spotify, playlists, Apple Music, YouTube. Uh, it's not so often that we walk away with a physical album cover. Uh, there is a wonderful New York Times podcast that asks this question, and I've linked it here. I encourage you to take a listen and draw your own conclusion. But I think it's important to mention that now we're seeing the vinyl record, the tape record, uh, have a revival in popularity, sort of as a combination of nostalgia for the past, the want for the wonderful physical touch of the object in hand, um, as even maybe a replacement for a real friend or a real person who's around um, in, our, in our current times. And uh, I, I encourage you to think about that question yourself, your own relationship to uh, owning physical copies of music um, yourself and what, what that means. And to conclude, if you'd like to go in depth with any of these albums and additional albums, I've included a whole list of albums that I think are really great examples of this, as well as album designers who uh, have sort of taken it to the next level. And if you'd like to read more, I've included additional citations for each of the notes sections in this slideshow. So I hope this gives you some inspiration and ideas in your own design process. And thanks for letting me share some of these wonderful references with all of you. <laughs>